It's 12.36 p.m. in Los Angeles on uh, Wednesday, the 13th of November, 2012. It's 3.36 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I, Mark Strassman, reporter with Utopia News, I'm about to talk to Jeffrey Miron, who is a uh, senior lecturer in economics at Harvard University and a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Welcome back to Utopia News. Thank you for having me. The occasion of this uh, uh, conversation is the passage uh, a week ago in uh, Washington State and Colorado of measures on the ballot that legalized uh, cannabis in those states. We're going to talk about that now. Could you tell us how close to the recommendations that you've been making about the reform of marijuana laws these uh, reforms uh, uh, are? So these two reforms had in, ter in the broad brush and the main aspects and exactly what I was suggesting, which is that marijuana is now under state law in each of those two states a legal product. Each of the two ballot initiatives also comes with a lot of details about exactly how it can be taxed and exactly how it should be regulated. And to me, that's kind of unnecessary complication. We could just say marijuana is now a legal product treated like every other legal product. But I don't think that does any great harm. The key thing is it can be produced, transported, distributed, and sold and possessed okay, without any legal punishment at all, without any legal consequences under the state law of those two states. Now, do, do these uh, campaigns use the argument that you previously suggested in a conversation we had that people should say marijuana smokers should be able to smoke marijuana, uh, or did they base their arguments on taxation benefits and, and other related issues? Well, I think they did both. Certainly the revenue benefits of being able to tax legalized marijuana and the expenditure savings now, those both came up in the debate, and they may have been important to some of the voters. Uh, certainly, lots of the people who were advocating these initiatives were also explaining that in a free society, people can do what they wish to do without any interference from the government, okay, unless those actions have some obvious negative impact on someone else. So driving under the influence, driving recklessly, okay, certainly something the government might want to uh, concern itself with but not just any use, any use that's not harming others uh, should be left to the freedom of the individual. Um, Fox News and the person of Elizabeth McDonald argued in a recent op-ed piece that there's a catch-22 confronting marijuana legalization because one, marijuana causes people to become criminals and two, the, the banking system won't be able to process the, uh, the business of these uh, marijuana outlets because of uh, federal law. What do you say to those two arguments? Well, the claim that marijuana makes people criminal is just completely ridiculous. There is zero evidence for that in any way, shape, or form. Okay? The claim that the state level legalization might run into some hassles, if not really serious impediments, from the federal sort of anti money laundering statutes, that's a serious concern. That is one way that the federal government might be able to discourage or prevent. Mm -hmm those states from actually implementing a fully legal regime because a legitimate business owner is not going to want to deposit his profits or his payroll or anything like that in a bank account if it's going to be at serious risk of being reported and seized by the federal government. To me, that of course is one reason why we shouldn't have ever had anti-money laundering statutes in the first place. I think those are incredibly misguided and do very little to prevent uh, illicit activity like drug use in any event, but she's raising a point that everyone will have to deal with. The federal law definitely conflicts with the state law on this issue. Okay, let's let's address that issue of, of federal law uh, con conflicting with the uh, the state law in this case. What are the options facing the Obama administration in its attitude towards these legalization measures? Well, I don't think that the administration by itself can simply repeal the federal law. That's something passed by Congress, but it could certainly take a pol an, an attitude of non-enforcement could direct the U.S. attorneys and the Drug Enforcement Administration and so on to simply make absolutely no attempt to seize drugs, to engage in asset seizures, to arrest people for marijuana charges in any way, shape, or form under the federal law in those two states. If they did that, several things are likely to happen. They'll obviously get some criticism from re Republicans and conservatives. They may get some pushback from their own U.S. attorneys, from some members of their own party. But in addition, they would course, also embolden a number of other states that are leaning in the direction of legalization to reconsider and try to do that as well. And so if they took that attitude, they basically, you know, unleash the issue for the whole country. 
Now, they can also take the attitude, which is they've taken with respect to medical marijuana so far, you know, for most of the last sort of four years, which is the federal law still exists. We're going to enforce the federal law in Colorado and Washington state. You may not enforce it super big. They may just do it sort of randomly or sort of sporadically, but they will continue to make arrests and they will try to prevent the full-scale operation of a legalized market in those two states. What forces, political and otherwise political and economic, do you think will will play a role in the administration's decision about what it's going to do? I I am nervous that they are not going to be especially disposed to leave these two states alone. So first of all, not. Obama himself, but members of the administration, members of Congress who are Democrats, etc., are going to be running for office again, and they are going to be nervous about taking sides on an issue that doesn't, is, if it's not consistent with public opinion. So that's going to give them some pause. Um, if, more generally, Obama and the Democrats accepted the view that states can ignore a federal law they don't like, then that sets a precedent for other federal laws that Democrats do like, such as Obamacare, such as a federal minimum wage law, such as many uh, environmental regulations and so on. Likewise, most conservatives want the federal government to be, imposing, be able to impose its will on the states. Okay, they just have somewhat different views about which laws they want to impose on all the states. So very few mainstream politicians they actually like the idea of letting states do as they please. So I think that's that's a, a chilling perspective. It's something that we should all, be, you know, people who approve of the legalization and want legalization should be nervous that the federal government is not going to be especially supportive. Well, what's happening with the lawsuit calling for the rescheduling, rescheduling of marijuana on the federal level? So I'm afraid I don't know exactly where that is at the moment, but those attempts have been going on for decades, and they depend at the end of the day on the good graces of the Drug Enforcement Administration to make a determination. And it's, you know, it's hard to see how that's going to happen okay, given prevailing attitudes. Now, of course, if public opinion starts to swing more substantially toward legalizing marijuana more broadly, then I think lots of politicians, both Democrat and Republican, will start to then respond to that and be more accepting. But um, it's a little bit unclear that that's going to happen in the near future. I think it's certainly going to happen eventually, but it's not so clear it's going to happen in the next few years. All right. Now, Washington State and Colorado already had medical marijuana regulations in place at the time they voted to legalize. Does it seem to you that authorizing the use of the use of medical marijuana is a necessary or helpful step on the road to cannabis legalization? I really don't know. I think we have some observations which suggest it is a helpful step and some observations where maybe it wasn't a helpful step. California is the obvious example where it wasn't obviously a helpful step because California had medicalized back in 1996. In 2010, they had a legalization initiative. The legalization initiative failed. And it seems to have failed in part because Eric Holder, the Attorney General, announced a few weeks before the November 2010 ballot that if legalization passed, the federal government would vigorously enforce the federal law in California trying to prevent legalization from really taking effect. And I think because the medicalization system was so broad and so permissive in California, a lot of people just thought to themselves, gee, and basically anybody who wants to get marijuana without much legal hassle can already do so. Why bother poking our finger in the eye of the federal government by going all the way toward legalization? So that was made me surprised that, in fact, it did pass in both Colorado and Washington. I was pleasantly surprised. I hadn't anticipated that because of the California experience. Now, question three in Massachusetts uh, passed last Tuesday with 63% of the vote. Is Massachusetts next for legal marijuana, or will people want to see how medical marijuana works out there first? My, it's just it's totally a hunch. I haven't seen any opinion polls or anything, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's, you know, four years, maybe eight years before a full legalization thing comes. But I also think very much for Massachusetts, for California, which was certainly considering trying again, and a few other states that are the most obvious locations, a lot is going to ride on what the federal government does over the next year or two years. The federal government is basically saying hands off, then I think a bunch of states will be relatively eager as maybe as soon as 2014 and certainly by 2016. The federal government interferes in Washington and Colorado in a way that really impedes their efforts then I think it's a much tougher thing to sell to the voters of any other state. 
Uh, what role will state agencies play in Washington State and Colorado in implementing the legal marijuana market, and how, how might this insulate growers, processors, distributors, retailers, and users against federal interference? Well, the state governments, just as with medical marijuana have to have procedures that license the people who can sell, who can distribute, and so on. And they can, on the one hand, act very quickly or act very slowly. Okay? Both of the governors in the two states where it passed were actually not in favor of the initiative. Both Democrats and both opposed it. So their administrations might sort of slow walk the implementation of the new legalization bills, or they might wait and see what sort of signal they get from the federal government before they decide how to do it. Um, there is no, doesn't need to be any great mystery. We have millions of legal products. It shouldn't be hard at all for the relevant state Department of Revenue or Public Health or whatever to allow marijuana to go ahead and become a legal product. It's a question of whether there's the will to do it, the way, you know, the, that's the issue that they'll have to confront. Oh, what's the outlook for tax revenues from these uh, measures in these two states? Well, if they really become fully legal, then they can certainly generate maybe 50 million a year each, uh, per, in each of these two states. Hey, that's not solving their budgetary issues, but it's certainly you know something that's non-trivial. Indeed, if they were the two states that legalized and other states did not, they might generate a lot more tax revenue in the short term because they'd become centers for uh, marijuana tourism. Okay, I think again, if that were to happen. Okay, in the short term, that would encourage other states to want to you know, get a bite of that pie, and therefore other states would attempt to legalize. Now, as, a, as an economist, tell us what you think the size of the market is going to be in these two states. Well, I have to think for a second to say exactly for the two states, but my estimates are that the size of the legalized marijuana market is somewhere in this sort of 15 to 25 billion range. It's hard to be really precise because it's an underground market so far and so on and so forth, but say some, say 20 billion just to choose a round number and if each of those states were to get 150th of that right that's what you know that's that's not a huge market and it's not going to generate tons and tons of tax revenue okay? but it's something it's one reason why legalization makes sense of course you also save the money that's being spent on arrest on prosecution incarceration but i think the far more important thing is by legalizing the state says this is a private matter. This is a choice that individuals can make or not as they see fit. And to me, that's a, prece it's a precedent that's beneficial in thinking about government policy much more broadly. We don't interfere with individual rights unless we have an absolutely compelling reason to protect innocent third parties. As an academic researcher, are you going to be uh, paying close attention to what happens there and studying the, uh, the rollout of these laws? Absolutely. They're certainly interesting. One thing academic researchers like is new data. And <laughs> So these two changes in, the pol in policy are kind of natural experiments. Um, unfortunately, it'll take two to three years before we get data on, say, the use rates and the tax revenue collections and so on from these states. But it's definitely something to stay on top of. Are you likely to be uh, consulted as a, uh, an expert on this by the state governments? Um, I don't know. I haven't been contacted by anyone yet. Um, I'm certainly happy to talk to people about it. Uh, it's not an area where I want to be a paid expert. I want to, my opinions on this subject to be, you know, immune from any accusation of bias because I'm a paid consultant or anything. So I, of course, talk to them if they want to talk to me, I, but I haven't done so yet. Okay. Now, President Calderon of Mexico and several Central American uh, heads of government said yesterday that the legalization in Washington and Colorado calls into question the whole strategy of the drug war. Uh, what do you have to say about what they've said? And they've, they've referred it to the uh, Organization of American States and presumably to the UN after that. Um, so it was very interesting what's ha happened with Felipe Calderon. It was, of course, Calderon who in 2006 escalated Mexico's war on drugs enormously, not just against marijuana, uh, just for clarity, against all sorts of drugs. And uh, m most people would estimate that there have been 30, 40, 50,000 lives lost over the past five, six years because of that escalation. And uh, better late than never, Calderon seems to have gradually come to the conclusion that that was not a very productive effort, that you just can never win that kind of a war. And there were all of these ancillary victims. And so he's now talking about other approaches, which is a sort of hint at thinking about legalization. What's also interesting is many, many, many former okay, South American presidents, prime ministers, and other leaders 
have called for some sort of decriminalization, legalization, but they never do it while they're in office. It seems to be just something too toxic to really talk about until you're at least on your way out. All right, and speaking about the toxicity of calling for marijuana legalization, does does the passage of, of these cannabis laws in uh, Washington and Colorado constitute a death knell for marijuana prohibition in the U.S., as some people have said, or are there still powerful forces who want to keep marijuana prohibition in place? Well, I, I'd say it's in between. I think public opinion has certainly been shifting. They're now, in some polls, more than 50 percent support for legalizing marijuana. So I think we're moving in that direction. Of course, sometimes when the pendulum swings a long way in one direction, it then swings back the other way. But I think overall the trend is toward more liberalized marijuana laws, but I don't know that it's necessarily something that's going to be fast and quick and that we're just on the verge of a complete revolution. I think the federal government, the Obama administration, might push back. And of course there will be other federal governments, even if this uh, administration is supportive of those legalization initiatives. It could be a different administration okay, that has a very different view uh, and could take a much tougher stance with respect to what the states are allowed to do. What role did big donors and national marijuana reform organizations play in getting these measures passed? Sorry again, what, what role will the... What role did big donors and national uh, marijuana reform organizations play in getting this passed? So I'm um, short answer is I don't know. I believe there were some uh, individuals who made significant contributions, but I simply don't know. In past, in past cases, there have been such large donations, but I really don't know the details of these two initiatives. Okay, and uh, what overall do you think this says about the mood of the population in terms of marijuana reform? Well, I think, as you know, we were discussing, it's gradually becoming more tolerant. More and more people have had some exposure to marijuana in college or after. They, more and more people have had kids who used marijuana okay, and then you know, go, went on to not become you know, hopeless drug addicts or any of the silly characterizations that are out there. You know, I think a lot of people thought that the tolerance toward marijuana legalization would happen sooner as the baby boom okay, matured and got to be sort of parents and voting age and all that. It didn't seem to quite happen that fast because a lot of those baby boomers say, seem to say to themselves, well, yes, I did that in college and I stopped, but I still don't want my children doing it. But now we're at the point where their children have gotten older, their children have done it, and now their children are off, you know, having, getting married and having kids and leaving normal lives. And I think all of that is just gradually, slowly but surely, taking the scariness away from more and more people. They know that the scare stories about marijuana can't be true because they've seen firsthand lots of people who use marijuana and not had terrible things happen to them. Okay, finally, why don't you wrap up by, by identifying some themes that people should keep in mind to best understand the continuing controversy and uh, evolution of marijuana legalization in the U.S. So to me, the really, really crucial theme, and a the theme that cuts across many policies, not just marijuana legalization, is the role of state versus federal government. Libertarians, of which, of which I'm one, tend to be very fond of the Ninth Amendment, which says all rights not explicitly given to the federal government should be left to the states or to the people. So we would tend to say that whether or not you prohibit alcohol or prostitution or marijuana, whether you have a minimum wage law, all sorts of things should simply be left to state governments and the federal government shouldn't interfere in favor of or against any of those things. But I think there's huge tension in the United States about that issue, about that federalism issue, and that's the crucial thing to keep one's eye on as we move forward. Okay, good. I want to thank you very much for your work on this issue and for talking to us about it today on Utopia News. Thank you very much.